Hello, my name is Adam Smith, and today we pick things up with our case where we left it off about two to three weeks ago when I finished up the how to set up video. If you haven't checked it out, I'll put a link in the top right hand corner as well as the unboxing up there that you can check out if you're interested in this one. Now, the how to set up video will show you how we got all these components to the table. It is worth mentioning we are set up for the tutorial, so the full game once we get past the tutorial will have a little bit more for the setup going on, a little bit more components out, more tokens. But right now, it's very streamlined as we just have the things out that are necessary. Now, at the end of the how to set up video, I did not have this play mat out in play. This came as part of the campaign as well. I picked it up and so I've placed it out here and also placed all the decks in different slots on it. All the episode specific cards are placed on the left hand side of the mat. The trauma deck is up top. Now, as you saw during the how to set up video, I placed tokens inside of game trays and these game trays are not part of the final production of the game in any way, shape or form. I just use them to organize tokens, but the playmat has specific spaces on it in the center for major tokens that are heavily used. Things like fate tokens up here, which are determined by the number of players as I'm playing solo. It will be 15 fate tokens as I set up in the previous video. And then down here we have the injury tokens as well as poison tokens. And it's worth mentioning on the far right, we have some discard piles for not only the cards we'll be drawing from over here once they're done we'll place them here and then we have the smaller discard pile for the trauma deck over there and we have an adversary space right here which currently doesn't have anything but as we go through the tutorial it'll likely crop up now for those unfamiliar with the two characters we have going on this adventure together, let's find out more about each of them through their backstories on their dashboards. We have Robert Pierce starting us out here. Robert is a respected Egyptologist, but his career is now behind him. His last adventures, which were in Riot's company, took place several years ago. Thus, when he received a letter from his friend inviting him to set off on new adventures and extremely promising ones at that, he was gripping with such enthusiasm that he invested every cent he had in what just might be his last ultimate adventure. Now, each of these characters Characters, and we'll go to the next one in a second, has an ability, which is listed out down here. The tutorial at this point has not told me that we're going to go ahead and get anything from the ability going through the tutorial, but we'll leave that aside for now. If we need to pull it into play at a certain point, I will bring it in. We'll talk about it, but each of these characters, knowing as you go further into the gameplay, will always have this ability to make use of. Typically, it gives them some type of a token or something that they can use when they're doing some type of action inside of the game. The second character I'm controlling is Riot, who is Robert's friend, and Riot's dashboard states, This midjay knows a desert like the back of his hand, the desert and its dangers. What some might mistake for cowardice is in reality perfectly legitimate caution and restraint. Preserving the treasures and customs of his land is extremely important to Riot. This is why he's chosen to accompany European expeditions to keep an eye on greedy, unscrupulous explorers who would have no problem besmirching the local cultures he loves so much. Again, there's an ability here. We'll skip past it for now and head right into the gameplay of the tutorial. Now, as you can see at the bottom of each of your character dashboards, you'll have a turn structure listed out, and each turn is going to consist of the four phases. Three are preliminary phases that depend on your situation at the start of the turn, and the fourth, the last one, the most important phase during which you make decisions and perform actions. You can perform two out of four possible actions. You can do things like moving, you can do things like searching, you can, of course, fight, and you can support. At the start of your very first turn, you won't be doing anything from phase one, two, or three. There'll be no applying of starter turn effects. There'll be no applying of starter turn effects on adversaries, and there's no reorganizing of your equipment. So we move right to performing up to two actions, and we can choose again through these four we have available, moving, searching, fighting, and supporting. So as we're starting off with Robert here on the left, we take a look at the tile that we're currently in and we have to see what is possible. First off, moving is impossible because we have a closed door in front of us. So we cannot move at this point. We can't fight because we have no adversaries to fight and we don't need to support anything. So the major thing we're going to do here is search. When an explorer is in the same zone as a search token, we can take a search action to interact with it. And what we do is we take a look at the symbol on the search token, we find the corresponding deck, and we reveal the card. Over here we find the matching icon, we simply flip the card and read it. 
Our search has revealed an event, and it states, as the sunset begins to glow blood red, you and your team arrive, ecstatic at the dig site. Your smile fades when you recognize a clenched, decomposing hand sticking up out of the desert. Your team helps you dig the corpse out of the burning sand, a tomb robber. His face shows the clear signs of terror and agony. In his bag, you find the head of an antique statue. Why carry something like that around? It tells us now to take two specific cards and without looking at them, return to the tutorial. I've gone ahead and found the two cards that match the symbols on the event card. We're now going to go ahead and flip over this one right here as it instructs in the tutorial. During the game, if you reveal a card that has a color that matches one of the four major actions on your character dashboard, you have found an equipment card, and that card now gets slotted into the empty slot that you have available next to the corresponding color. If you already have a yellow card in this spot, you get to decide which of the two you'd rather have at this point in time. Whichever one you don't take will end up going to your backpack. And most of the time, the card is going to improve the action in question. So Robert now has the broken head equipment card. You can see right here, it says your intuition tells you to keep this object with you no matter how repugnant it is. And always remember inside of your turn, when you get to phase three, of course we skipped this during the very first turn of this game, you can reorganize your equipment, which will allow you to move things around to make maybe the most use of what you have. One more thing to mention about that yellow support card we just got is that not always will you understand the equipment cards that you're gaining and what they're used for in a particular moment. It might take some time, some exploration, interaction with different things in the game world to truly understand what to use when and what that item might be beneficial for and in what situation. So those things will unfold as you go through gameplay and that's part of the journey. The second card is revealed and it states, Defiler, the accusation echoes in your ears. You're suddenly gripped by a deep unease and an icy sweat rolls down your spine. Your teammates catch you as you start to pass out. When you come to, you are convinced that your only salvation will be to reunite the statue's head with its body. We're going to keep this card in front of us. It states down below, at the start of your turn, put one fate token on this card. If any explorer, you or someone else, is supposed to take a fate token and the stock is empty, you take another card as depicted by the symbol here which doesn't look pleasant. Now there's three things to mention about this card. As you see in the top right hand corner there's an eye symbol. That is going to let you know that this card will stay in play instead of being discarded. So whenever you see that green eye symbol the card stays in play. What we also know is that the card back, the background of the card itself, is black and that indicates that this needs to be slotted on the top of the character that interacted with the search action that found this card. So this card is now tied to Robert. So it goes in the very top slot on the character profile. Also on this card you'll also see the exclamation mark in the triangle and circle in red near the bottom of the card that's letting us know we now have a start of turn effect which is going to apply every time Robert takes his start of turn so as we didn't have anything to do at the beginning of the game we now have something that will be triggering we've now completed the search action so we'll discard the card for the event and also discard the token now as a second action, I'm going to search once again. You may use a search action to open doors. So when you want to do this, you're going to take the card, match this symbol on the door. You're going to see it, which is literally slotted in at the very top of the door, and you're going to reveal that card. We found the matching card. Let's reveal it and find out what happens. The entrance to the buried building that Rebecca had mentioned is down below. A few steps away from your macabre discovery, the tomb robber had closed it carefully. Was that to prevent people from entering or from leaving? Like a slow poison, fear spreads, but your thirst for truth and the call of adventure are stronger. You glance at your teammates and then open the thick door. Something tells you that nothing will ever be the same again after you've gone through the door. The door has now opened and we know it's open as the token has been removed from the top of the door. The door card has been discarded. It's worth mentioning when you do a search action on a door, it's going to open the door every time unless stated otherwise by a card. Now at this point, Robert has taken two actions, so Robert's turn is over. We now move over to Riot. For Riot, we take a look at the turn structure. We know one, two, and three phases do not apply for Riot. So what else are we going to do here? Well, in this tutorial, we're going to move because the door is now open and we've searched everything inside the tile we were in. So Riot has moved into the room. When you move in the game, you're moving from zone to zone. So this zone right here completely cleaned up, nothing else to do here. I've moved from this zone into this one. You'll see some other zones will actually be made up of two sections with a dividing line in between. And during your travels, you'll find other rooms, which will be divided into four different zones. 
Riot's second action will be to search the token in the room. I found the corresponding card. Let's flip it and find out what it is. But just before we do that, we're going to talk about this die right here, the white one. It is known as the inspection die. Now we have yet to use the inspection die to this point, but some search cards will tell you to roll the inspection die and will let you check off corresponding spaces in your expedition logbook, which is the one that you should be following as you go through the tutorial. It's currently in my hand right now. That will be the space to be able to check those things off. So let's go ahead and reveal the card and then we'll talk more about this inspection die. It appears we found a chest and it's been abandoned in the corner of the room. Your teammates are delighted with the find, but you are perplexed. Why did the robbers leave it alone? It must be tamper proof. Or maybe they were interrupted. Now it states below you're going to roll two inspection dice. So we might as well bring that second one down and try to open the chest and log the results. Now before I make my roll, let's talk about all six sides of the inspection die. One side has the X symbol on it, which is the failure side of the die. This side right here represents the fate side. If you want, you can take one of the fate tokens from the pool that you had set up at the beginning of the game, which I have 15 of, take one token that matches place it inside of your backpack, and that will allow you to change this icon here to anything you want. So that can drive you towards potentially better successes or getting something that you might want or going down a certain path, but it comes at a cost. The cost is that you're dwindling the number of fate tokens that you have overall by placing one inside of your backpack to change that result to something that you'd like, which is bad for two reasons. One, if this particular reserve goes all the way down to nothing, or you have fate tokens going inside your backpack, it's not a good omen overall for the game and bad things can happen. The other four sides of the die have a magnifying glass, a book, a torch, and a gear. Let's go ahead and make the roll and see whether we can pull off getting a gear symbol. And if we do, we get the top result. If we don't, we get the bottom result. Let's see how this goes. We got ourselves two gears. Okay. I know one of them rolled off camera there, but we did in fact get two. That doesn't matter how many because we just needed at least one to take that top result. After rolling the dice and seeing the results, you come to the logbook entry and you're going to mark which results you got. I got two gear symbols, so I'm placing two X's across that row. You'll see as you complete rows or columns even potentially, there's things to gain like money, XP. And this column right here, if we complete, it says when the column is complete, you discover a mysterious object, take the corresponding card. After logging our results, we head back here. Look at this symbol it tells us to find in the card. We found that card, flipped it over, and we have another event. This one states, your dexterity and a bit of luck defeat the lock, and you manage to open the chest. Deep in the chest, beneath scraps of moldy fabric, a large number of coins bearing the worrying face of a pharaoh stare back at you. You are a renowned Egyptologist, and yet this monarch is completely unknown to you. At this point, we're going to roll two inspection dice and log the results, then move all the other explorers into this room. Let's go ahead and make the roll. We'll mark the results in the logbook afterwards. We got ourselves another gear and a book. That was pretty awesome. We got the third gear symbol we need in order to complete that row. We also got one book symbol, which means we have two of the four symbols to going ahead and finding out what that mysterious object is. All the explorers have now moved into the room. As it states in the event card, we'll discard these two event cards and also the search token. And just like that, both of our characters have taken their very first turn, and although they skipped through the first three phases on their first turns and went right to taking actions, as we go back to Robert, we'll remember that we do have a start of turn effect we'll have to resolve right off the hop. We're back to Robert, and we do have a start of turn effect for Robert, and it states, at the start of your turn, place one fate token on this card. Fate token has been placed, and it's worth noting, once we don't have any more fate tokens to place on this card when we're supposed to, then it tells us to take a specific card. We probably do not want that to happen. Let's continue on. We don't have any start of turn effects for any adversaries, and we don't want to reorganize our equipment, so at this point, Robert is going to interact with the door and search it. I found the card that matches the door. The door is now open using the search action, and it states, a dark, wide corridor stretches before you as you hold up your torch. Sparkles of gold and jade shimmer like stars on the walls and ceiling. You marvel at the sight, but only for a short moment because a pungent smell attacks your nose. You quickly discover its source, a mutilated corpse, probably that of a robber, is being torn apart by strange metallic silhouettes that look like insects. When one of your poor victim's eyes slides out of its socket, you let out a frightful Yelp. The machines freeze and then attack. The door card has thrown our very first adversaries. We simply place them based on the card, which is simply one scarab here and three in this room over here. These again are represented as two different zones with a line between them. 
My second action is for Robert to move into the same room as the adversaries, and when he does move into a room with adversaries, one or more of them, he's going to find the corresponding adversary profile card. You'll take an adversary profile for each adversary named, so one profile per the name of the adversary in there. If there happens to be multiple different ones in there, you'll pull a profile card for each of them. In this case, the Scarab here has five potential cards that could come, so we're going to shuffle these face down and draw one at random. Now let's talk about the adversary profile and how it's broken out. We'll only focus on the left-hand side of it for now. The rest will leave for combat later on. So you'll see it's health. Top left-hand corner is one. Start a turn effect in this case is take one injury plus one extra injury for each scarab in adjacent zones. This is a start of turn effect, so not nice. And then also in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see two actions listed and negative effects. This basically means if we do a search action or a move action, this negative effect will apply. In this case, it's exactly the same. Other adversaries will likely be different. Now, just to be completely clear, in terms of when that Scarab start of turn effect will trigger, it would trigger in your phase two, which we've already passed by. We're all the way down in performing up to two actions. We're actually at the tail end of it as we've done both of our actions. It's now Riot's turn and he sees his friend in the other room with scarabs all around and he wants to go in and help him out. He looks through his turn structure. He has nothing for phase one and two. So no starting of turn effects are going to impact him. Nothing to reorganize in the inventory. So going right to actions, we're going to move right into the room. And I'm pretty sure you guys all know what I'm going to do for my second action. We need to fight this scarab. Just a heads up that I forgot to place a door card in the discard pile. No gameplay impact, but just worth mentioning in case you're wondering why that magically appeared there. Now we're going to go into a fight action. We roll two fight dice. If we happen to see this fate symbol right here, we can go ahead and take a fate token from the reserve over here, place it in our backpack. And as I mentioned before, both of those things are not so great and have rippling impacts later on potentially. So that will allow us to use that as a wild if we wish. And it's a may. You don't have to do it, but you can do it. Now there's other sides to these dice. You have two sides sides that succeed with a check mark, two sides with the exclamation mark, and you have, and these are represented by specials, and then the fail result is an X with one. So two, two, and one, and then the fate side. That makes up the six sides of the dice. We're gonna go ahead and roll these two dice and see what we get off of our fight action. Now at this point we go to the table with the results of our roll and we start working our way top to bottom. So the very first one here for the success that we got says eliminate one scarab, which is great because if we eliminate it and we move on down to go to this one, it says take one injury for each scarab in your zone. Well, there won't be one, so we don't have to take the injury. So Riot was able to move into the room and with his final action, take out the scarab. With the Scarab now eliminated, the zone is free. In other words, any search actions or move actions won't have negative effects for us. Now let's take a moment and talk about the one deck of cards I don't want to draw from, and that is the Trauma deck. You only draw from this deck if you're getting your fifth injury. Every time you get an injury before your fifth one, you're going to be placing them right on your player dashboard. There's four slots for injury, so you'll fill those all the way up, and when you're supposed to take your fifth one, you'll draw a Trauma card, and then you'll discard all the injuries on your player dashboard. Here's an example of the top card off the trauma deck. And just so you understand, inside the trauma deck, there are six different types of trauma cards. What you see here in front of you is one of the four basic actions being impacted by a trauma card. And because it's red, yes, it does tie to the fight action. So you'll basically be aware of the fact that this is now going to happen every single time you take a fight action. And this is a really negative thing because if you get a fail result on the fight roll, it's now going to count for double, making things even worse for you. And that's, of course, is going to have that thing trigger twice, which is not so great on the Scarab card, for instance, if we happen to be attacking those adversaries. Now, inside the deck, there are also yellow, green, and blue for all the other basic actions. So that covers four of the different types of trauma in the deck, but there are two more. One other one is neutral. So basically, it's just going to be a trauma that throws something at you. No idea what that will be, but you will experience it as you go. And the other is going to impact your ability. And your ability is one that's printed right on your player dashboard. So it might, you know, kind of tone it down, it might eliminate it, who knows? The other thing that's worth mentioning is that because you can have equipment cards tied to a basic action, so for instance, we picked up that broken head with Robert and it's sitting in his support area. If we had got a support based trauma, you can combine the trauma with the equipment card that you have. There might be certain weird combinations of things you can pull off. The final thing to be aware of with trauma cards is if you take one in the same category as a trauma you already have, you put it back under the trauma pile and take one fate token from the stock instead. 
So again, here we are at the character dashboard. You can again see the injury token slots here once you fill up all four and then you get a fifth one. Then you're gonna go ahead and take a trauma card and discard all the tokens that are on the dashboard. Here is a look at a support action and an equipment card that's tied to it. So it's worth noting you can take a supportive action, which we haven't done yet, when you're in the same space as another explorer in order to trade. There is one constraint, it has to be one item traded and it can be an equipped item or from your backpack. Or you might even use a support action instead of using it for a trade to actually activate the card that you have. You might actually have an equipment card that has something on it that can be triggered through a support action. Now at this point, we're gonna get off the rails with the tutorial and we're gonna move through completing the rest of the tutorial scenario. So we no longer have anything we need to learn. We can continue to play on. It's worth mentioning one thing though, is that the abilities that each of these two characters possess, we can now make use of them. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and take any tokens that are tied to them and we'll read both abilities to get an understanding as to what they do. Robert's ability states that he is going to start each episode with two coins on his profile every time he rolls the dice. You can discard one of these coins to turn one die to any side. At the end of the episode, the explorers earn any unused coins. So if you actually hold on to them all the way to the very end, they actually count towards bonuses for the end of the scenario. Now, the one thing to mention is we are in the tutorial. I wanted to show you the coins that he starts the episode with, but for the tutorial, we're going to take these out of the equation as I don't believe we get them because it was not at the very beginning that we first had the ability activated and ready to go for us. So we're going to take these away for now and we'll go over and check out Riot's. Riot's ability states, at the start of your turn, remove one injury from another explorer in your zone. Now this ability is not saying that it starts at the very beginning of a scenario. So I'm gonna not take Robert's because we are already part way through the tutorial and I don't believe I'm supposed to have those coins going in. I could be wrong, but I'm gonna play it as it's written. This though, I'm gonna go ahead and use this ability whenever I want because his end of turn is gonna come around all the time. So we're back to Robert for his turn and he's got that start of turn effect. So he's gonna go ahead and place another fate token from the reserve on the card. Now Robert's in a zone with two things he could potentially search. So why don't we do it? He's gonna spin around 180. We'll search that first one. After searching, he comes up with something very useful. Robert has found a whip and this ties to his fight action as it's read here. It says, you may reroll one die one time when you roll fight dice. Not too shabby. Everything seems to be happening for Robert at the moment. For his final action, he's going to move, head right into the zone with the Scarabs, and again, that movement and search negative effect will apply, but it's the end of his turn right now, and he's not planning on doing any of that anyway. Riot's going to go ahead and do a search action on the token in his zone. Riot ended up finding a first aid kit, not a bad thing to have. This is going to go in a supporting slot for him. Discard one trauma from an explorer in your zone. And for his second action, Riot's going to move right into the zone with all the enemies. Robert's turn is going to be an active one. He's got a start of turn effect that's going to trigger, so we're placing a fate token from the reserve right here. So we now have three on this card, which means we have 12 left in the reserve. And next up, we're going to apply start of turn effects for the adversaries we're grappling with. We're in a space with scarabs, and when the start of turn effect comes from them, it stays to take one injury plus an extra injury for each scarab in an adjacent zone. Thank goodness the extra scarabs are not in the adjacent zones. We cleared the one out that we moved from, so it's only only one injury at this point. I'm gonna choose not to reorganize my inventory. Let's head into our two actions. So Robert's gonna be going ahead with his fight action and he's got a whip so he can reroll and that's pretty nice. He can reroll once during this fight action. So let's see how we do. Two dice going in. We got two exclamation marks, which is actually not terrible. Now that's gonna tell us if we choose to keep this and not do the reroll for the whip that I have, it's gonna eliminate one scarab and take an injury and then the same thing will happen. So we can basically take away two scarabs and take two injuries. Now I'd prefer to get one of the checks. In other words, one of the successful results, the green one. So I'm gonna try and reroll one of these and hope for the best let's see if we get lucky we got we got it oh my gosh that's awesome so we got an elimination of a scarab then we get to eliminate a second one and we take an injury so at this point poor robert has two injury tokens on him remember we do have riot in the same space who has a first aid kit could potentially help robert out the whip has really helped us as we just re-rolled for that fight action we did we've only done one action so we might as well fight one more time because if we can try and stop the start of turn effect from triggering on riot if we can clear out the zone then riot won't be affected by anything nasty on his turn Second fight action coming up for Robert as he uses his whip. He has a reroll to use. We got ourselves a fate icon here, an exclamation mark. I'm definitely going to do a reroll. Let's go ahead and reroll the fate one, I think. Oh, it ends up being a fail. That is not good. But you know what? We can take things as is. 
Uh, that might not have been the greatest decision. Uh, we're going to take the exclamation mark because we have to eliminate one scarab and take an injury, which is not good. But then we're going to take another injury after this because of the X we just rolled. And I'm just taking a look here to see if there's anything I can do. Again, if I had the coins and I was using Robert from his starting ability from the very beginning, I'd be able to do a spending of a coin to reroll a die. In this case, I will not. So we're going to have a full four injuries on poor Robert. It's now Riot's turn to activate, and one correction I need to make as I misspoke, the first aid kit that I talked about prior is only to help with trauma cards. It's going to allow you to discard a trauma from an explorer in your zone. It does not help with injuries, but Riot's ability on here states at the end of his turn he can remove one injury from another explorer in his zone. So basically, if I can keep Riot next to Robert, he can slowly start healing him up. I can't see any reason why I shouldn't use an action to search this. Let's go ahead and do it. We found ourselves an event underneath this individual. It says you find the decomposed body of a tomb robber under a thick layer of dust. A broken lance tip is lodged in his ribs. Roll two inspection dice and log the results. If you roll at least one of the magnifying glasses, you take a specific card. If not, you take a different card. Let's go ahead and see how we do on this roll. We got ourselves a magnifying glass and a torch. So we're going after this top result. We found the robber's medallion. It says you very cautiously remove a bronze medallion from the tomb robber's pocket. Despite the situation, you are captivated by the discovery. When you get this card, roll two inspection dice and log the results. So before we do that, we need to log the results of this roll right here. And guess what? I kid you not, we got the two results we needed to complete the full column. We got the torch and the magnifying glass. So this column's complete, which states when the column is complete, you discover a mysterious object. Take the corresponding card. It appears Riot is starting to find some things. He got himself the robber's medallion and now an onk. That's pretty awesome. This ritual object radiates a mysterious power. It is warm to the touch and heavier than it seems. You may discard this card when an explorer receives their fifth injury. Wow, uh, that would be really handy seeing as Robert is on the cusp of that. Exactly. If you do, that explorer discards all their injuries but does not take a trauma. That is awesome to have. Now going back to the robber's medallion, let's go ahead and make our roll with the inspection dice. We get two, let's see what we get. We're gonna log the results afterwards. An X, which is a failed result, and a book. So overall, we're working our way across the rows now. The book is going to fill in this one right here, which will gain us $2. Again, at the very tail end of the episode, we'll be able to gain everything, except for this one, which says we immediately go ahead and get the object. But these other ones will come at the very end in terms of experience and dollars. Now, you might have noticed something on the cards I just got. This one is listed as an item, artifact, relic. This one is an item and a relic. These both can be placed inside of the backpack. Again, these are not going to go in any slots. They have a dollar value in the bottom right-hand corner of two each. Riot has secured his items in his backpack and for his second action uses a search action to open the door. I've got the token out of the door and found the appropriate card. It states, incredible, the hieroglyphs adorning this doorway tell the story of a divinity you know nothing about. What secrets are you going to uncover? What truths are hiding within these walls? Your heart beats wildly with excitement. You open the door cautiously. In the middle of the room, you see the scrawny body of another tomb robber staring back at you with a morbid grimace. In an ironic twist of fate, this tomb became his own. Roll two inspection dice and log the results. Let's go ahead and grab two dice, make a roll, and see what happens. We got ourselves a torch and a book. Not bad, not bad at all. We were able to cross off this one, which will complete this row for $2. So the only one we haven't completed now is the magnifying glass. Riot's turn is now done, and he's going to use his end-of-turn ability in order to heal an injury away from Robert, dropping him from four down to three injuries. Having your friend heal an injury is always a good thing. Robert's turn begins. We place a fate token on the card. Robert's going to take his first action, heading east through the open door. And now in the room, he has the opportunity to interact with either of these with a search action. We'll go for the one at the very top. The search action resulted in an event card. It states a golden statuette stands on a platform bathed in soft light coming from a high ceiling. You wonder what ingenious methods made the scene possible. Historically speaking, this object is not worth much, but selling it could bring in a hefty sum. Why haven't robbers taken it? You realize they must not have made it this far. And you, what are you going to do? So we can choose to take this, and if we do, we pull a specific card. If not, we put this card back in the pile. You may be shocked by this, but I'm going to choose to actually place that back in the pile. I don't want to interact with that yet, as it sounds like it might trigger something nasty. Let's just continue clearing out the rooms for now, and maybe we'll interact with this later on. 
Robert's turn is done. Ryan's turn begins. Nothing for the first two phases. I don't want to reorganize my inventory, so we perform two actions. He's going to move into the room and search the final item there. Ryan found himself a crowbar. Pretty awesome. He doesn't have anything to impact his fight action. This one says roll an extra die when you roll the fight dice. So that's going to certainly come in handy. Also worth noting, I placed back this token here because we didn't finish it off. We chose to kind of not interact with it and put the card back in the deck. Riot's turn is now complete. His end of turn ability allows him to heal an injury off of Robert. So I've taken one off. Now just two injuries left on Robert. Now Robert's going to go ahead and activate right now. We'll place a fate token and he's going to take his actions. Robert's got five fate tokens now on his player dashboard. We're going to move Robert into the hallway area and interact with the door. Robert is using a search action and gets a door card. It says the door is blocked. You don't recognize the hieroglyph on its pediment, but it certainly piques your curiosity. How are you going to open it? If any explorer in this zone has the crowbar, they discard it and you take a specific card. If not, you put this card back in the pile and leave the token on the door. So long story short, Robert's going to have to wait until Riot's turn in order to have anything happen here at the door. So as of right now, that is my two actions anyway. A move and a search interaction to try and open the door did not work out. Robert's turn is done. We move to Riot. Riot's turn begins and he moves into the hallway with the first action. He's going to interact with the door in the same manner Robert did, but this time with the crowbar, he's able to actually interact with it. The door opens slowly with a deep and majestic groan. Your eyes light up when in the middle of the room you see a pedestal topped by a majestic beheaded statue. Finally, what's going to happen when you put the head you found at the start of this adventure back in its rightful place? Suddenly, anxiety rushes horrifically up your spine. In the gloom, the abominable metallic clicking has started up again. Three more scarabs have shown up in this room, and that is going to be the end of Riot's turn. Again, being in the same space as Robert, able to heal Robert, so now he only has one injury on his dashboard. Robert's turn starts off, and he takes another fate token. He's now up to six. Robert's going to run right into the room with the first action, and then do a fight action. Robert moving into a room with an adversary has us pulling a profile card for the enemy. Let's find out what it is. So we now have the profile card for the Scarab, and there are some differences you'll see this time around. With this group, the start of turn effect is going to be moving all Scarabs from an adjacent zone to your zone. If there are no Scarabs in those other zones, you add a Scarab to your zone. So regardless, you're going to have more fun coming your way. Again, this only triggers in the early portions of a character's turn. We're currently at the back end of Robert's turn, so this is not going to apply right now. And then we have the search action here. If we choose to take it, we take an injury for every Scarab in our zone. That's not good. Moving, we have the same situation happening. We're taking an injury for every scarab so we really want to try to limit doing those things on the fight side of the equation you'll see a breakdown that's fairly similar to what we had with the prior one we either eliminate a scarab we either eliminate one and take an injury or we take an injury for each scarab in our zone now at least with robert we do have a re-roll so that should certainly help us get past the nastiness of taking damage from multiple scarabs so long as we don't roll two x's please don't have that happen oh my gosh what a wild roll so here we go this is where we get so certainly going to re-roll first and then we'll decide about the fate icons after that but that's quite the oh my gosh i can see the game is starting to try and mess with me right now so i'm to go ahead i think because we're not going to be taking anything too bad in this case i could just say that this whole so the interesting thing with this is that if you get something like this and you choose not to action these fate icons you basically just have a wash of an action so nothing bad comes back at you but you've burnt an action you could have been productive so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take one fate token and we're going to place this on or on the backpack of robert so we've got one less in the pool now which is not good uh, but that's going to be able to allow us to convert one of these to a success so we can just eliminate one of them making it easier for riot later on that does it for Robert's turn. Now Riot is going to move into the room and, of course, do a fight action. Now things get a little bit more interesting with Riot because he gets to roll an additional die with his crowbar when doing the fight action. So he's got three dice going into this one. And I'm really hoping for positive results. Again, always remember when you are resolving dice from your combat, always resolve top down. That is very important because you might actually kill them off before the nasty things start to trigger and you start taking injuries. So hopefully we get lots of green. Okay, so we ended up taking out one of them cleanly and then we're going to eliminate another one, but Riot is going to take an injury. Overall, pretty good. And the end of turn effect for Riot is he can heal. He's going to heal Robert. That's taking away the last injury that he has. So Riot has done all the work over the last handful of rounds in order to get Robert back to full health. Robert's turn now begins. He's going to take another fate token from the pool. This is going to give him a total of seven on the card and one on his backpack. 
We got ourselves an event, and it states, bathed in the light, filtering through the ceiling, a decapitated statue dominates the room. It's clear the head you found at the entrance once belonged to it. If any explorer in your zone, you or someone else, has the broken head, take the card that's specific right on this one. If not, you put the card back in the deck, and of course, you can interact with this later. We do have the head, and to be completely honest, I'm going to leave that other thing I didn't search a kind of a surprise for you as you go through the tutorial yourself. You can try and interact interact with that other one that I didn't. So I'm not spoiling absolutely everything here inside of this tutorial. So let's go ahead and we're going to put the broken head and interact with this event here. And that's going to allow us to take a specific card. Let's find out what happens. We ended up with an event and it's worth clarifying that the broken head does not get discarded. You simply just have to have that head in order to do this interaction and get this event card. It states, more and more golden scarabs are coming out of the cracks of the floor, walls and ceiling. Their snapping mandibles sound like deadly mechanical thunder. You can already feel them slipping under your clothes to devour you alive, but no, you won't die here. With a final push, you climb onto the pedestal and put the head of the statue back in its rightful place. All the killer insects retreat to the back of the room and disappear into the cracks. At this point, if any scarabs are in play, we're removing them all, and we roll two inspection dice and log the results. All right, let's go ahead and make some rolls. Let's see if we can get some of those magnifying glasses. Remember, those are the only ones that I didn't have to unlock that particular row, and we got one, but we needed two, I believe. So as you can see inside the logbook entry here for the magnifying glass, we need two more. We only got one at this point. Now this event tells us specifically to discard the broken head. So at this point, we do discard this card. We'll know it's the one that it's referring to here as it matches the symbol on the card. And Defiler is the other one, which was at the top of Robert's uh, dashboard, his entire play almost. And this is the one that was throwing fate tokens on it. So both of these are gone. We now read the positive epilogue in the camp archives. Now here's a look inside the camp archives. It's going to tell you exactly what to do. It says when instructed to do so, take one of these epilogue stickers and stick it in the space provided for it in the logbook. So you can do this, or you could of course keep track of it in a different way. Maybe you make note of it inside of your phone, or maybe you put a check mark next to the sticker so you don't have to actually pull it off. It's completely up to you. It just depends on whether or not maybe you plan on replaying this in the future and stuff like that. But basically you have these two outcomes in the tutorial. Of course, future scenarios might have varying uh, epilogues or the end of each of those different scenarios we'll see but the positive epilogue here says the discovery of this temple will make history and the mechanical creatures are very living proof that you are not insane indeed those prestigious inventions confirm your theory that this remote part of egypt was once the cradle of a civilization that had much more advanced technology than anyone has previously guessed with thousands of stars shining in the inky sky you have trouble falling asleep wrapped in feverish excitement it says here take the bonuses from the check mark in your logbook and you've unlocked upgrade C01. Now down below here it states if you've unlocked the positive epilogue, which we did, you have access to a new upgrade for your camp. If you don't have the necessary funds or you want to save your money, you can always buy it later. It says after this experience, you and your colleagues decide to set up headquarters to better prepare for your future expeditions. It states here, this is a dollar, and it says at the start of each episode, the first player rolls one inspection die and logs results. So it gives you a leg up on your future exploration. Inside the logbook, you'll see the outcome section, which is right underneath the logbook entry. And this is where you're going to go ahead and place the sticker based on how you did. This will keep track of things as you go along, of course. And again, you can also track this in different ways if you feel like it. You could technically use something like a post-it note in here to let you know whether you came from a positive or a negative conclusion. There's different ways that you don't have to actually use the stickers if you prefer not to. Now, in the logbook entry here, you've got rows to complete. So anywhere we've actually successfully completed a row, we get that result, which is dollars here, which is going to be nice. We're going to get a total of four dollars here we're gonna get just two xp as we missed out by just one magnifying glass from getting four xp Within the logbook, there is a whole section on how things work back at camp. So just at a high level here, the epilogue we've dealt with, we now open the camp archives, which we just did, got the stickers we need, and place them in the appropriate spaces. Moving on to logbook entry bonuses, that's what we just talked about moments ago, where we checked off rows and columns and gained those things. Now, tokens that come from this, whether they be gold, which of course I have four, and then two XP, that is going to go inside of this expedition box right here. XP and gold that is gained this way is only gained at the end of the episode. Never ever forget the fact that if you complete a column and it tells you that you gain a card, you immediately gain the card. Don't wait until the very end of the episode to take that card as it could be beneficial for you. Now it states right here we move into installing upgrades and it tells us the spread of how our camp looks is sitting on pages 62 and 63. So let's take a look. 
Here's a look at the camp, and this is where we can install upgrades. So one of the stickers we got from this book in the bottom right-hand corner will go in one of these slots. And overall at the camp, you can use each of the effects listed below one time during each back at camp phase. It also mentions here you have access to experience cards levels one and two, and take up to two reroll tokens from the camp box and distribute them however you like among your explorers. Now, as you know, from the end of the scenario, we got ourselves one of these upgrades unlocked. That doesn't mean we automatically get to place a sticker at the camp. We have to pay the cost to install it. Now, it mentions right here in this paragraph, there's many ways in order to sell things to acquire more coins. Of course, as your coins increase over the course of the campaign, you'll be able to do more and more. Moving on to the next paragraph, it just talks about spending coins. If you got the positive result and unlock that one new upgrade, you can spend gold at this point in order to put it in your camp. Of course, if you got the negative epilogue, you don't have access to any new upgrades at this point because of the failure of that particular episode. So there are ripple effects going through. Now, something else to touch on is one of the other things that are happening around your camp, and this is going to give you access to level one and two experience cards. Those cards are provided in the box for episode zero. You may have earned experience points, which we did during the episode. We got two experience. A level one experience card costs one and a two costs two. Very easy to remember. Then it gives you a breakdown as to how you can spend your XP. You're doing it as a team. If you're playing solo, you have full control without any worry about anyone's opinions on what you should and shouldn't do here. And you can really pinpoint your XP exactly where you want it to go. Now you likely already noticed, but when we opened up the camp pages, we had both this and this referenced there in a short high level sentence or two. But this is just giving more details on both of them and how you can interact with them and what benefits you can get. We have a half page left to go over. Very easy. Reroll tokens. Pretty straightforward. If you gain one, put it in your backpack. If you use it, discard it, and you can reroll any dice. You have here injuries and trauma. This one is going to just simply let you know that your injuries are all wiped away in between when you're back at the camp. They're all going to go away, but your traumas are going to sit there. They're not going to get wiped away. The only way to do this is to have another explorer or some type of game effect be able to take these away. As you know, Riot found a first aid kit which allows him to get rid of a trauma. So if we ever get one, we'll be able to use that first aid kit to get rid of it. The backpack serve not only to keep things organized while you're playing the game, but also in between and when you pack it up and store it away. So this is very, very handy. Everything that that explorer owns can go into the backpack. And of course, there are ways to reorganize your inventory to get the cards out that you want to actually make use of tied to your character dashboard. Now, finally, we have remaining cards, which is simply just cleaning up all the remaining cards for the episode that you're playing. Also, any cards bearing this symbol are also discarded. Remember, when we pulled the first one at the beginning of the play, I told you that it sits in play indefinitely, at least until it's told that it's discarded. But if you have any in play sitting out when you get to the very end, they are taken away. And that, my friends, wraps up all you need to know in order to get a base level understanding for Arceus. The game will continue to throw more and more at you as you go along. Remember, the tutorial here is a stripped down version of the full experience. So not every component, not everything is being used, but we've learned everything at a base level to the point we can now dig into the experience that much further. And that, my friends, is going to wrap up the showcase for Arceus. I really hope this helps you get rolling that much faster. Had a lot of fun with this one. And as you can see, this definitely sits on the light to medium side of the equation. So as a dungeon crawler and a game that you can really dig into with very little setup time and very little admin work, you can go on quite the adventure without a ton of rules bogging you down. This one moves really nicely, really seamlessly, and has a lot of little surprises along the way. And as you get further into the episodes, things really start to open up. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo!